So um, today's guest is Haji. I was just asking you earlier on how you pronounce your surname. I'm gonna try. Kaimo Bruce. Brilliant. Perfect. Okay, cool. Today's guest is Adi Kabovitz from Virtual Actuary. And um, before we dive into um, the topic for today, I just want him to give you a bit of background as to who he is and what his company does um, so that you guys can have um, a view of what, what he does and maybe if there's opportunities where you guys are ready to do it together, you can exchange um, information after the event. But otherwise, thank you so much again for joining us and to start up going to harness back. Thank you. You're going to enjoy your stay in your work and this conversation as well. Thank you. Um, so yeah, welcome to start up going to your work. Great. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And uh, I heard there was really good wind in Joburg, and I'm a kite surfer, so I flew straight in. And then I realized with all the buildings, there was going to be uh, too many gusts. And so <clears throat> uh, there was no kite surfing, but I decided to come anyway. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So um, when we, everyone that we interview at Startup Grind Joburg, or literally any Startup Grind in the world, we always want to um, get a sense of who they are, their background, um, where they grew up and just to try and understand you better. Um, so who is Adi? And just give us a little bit of feedback. Thanks. So hopefully, after I, I talk a little bit, I'll fit into the category of influential and amazing. Like at the moment, I'm at the bottom of the ladder, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I also have a ladder to climb today to live up to that. So who am I? So um, so I, have a com I, I opened a company called Virtual Actuary. I'm not an actuary. So our business... Um, as consulting actuaries. <clears throat> you get actuaries that work at the business, spread across the different sectors, life insurance, general insurance, which is different, pensions, healthcare, investments, and banking. <clears throat> I think there might just be another one in there somewhere. And so they work at the company itself. And then on the other side, you have the consultancies. There's the big four that everyone knows about. They are consulting actuaries who also consult into those sectors, but they're consultants, it's a bit different. <clears throat> so we have a consultancy, a consulting actuary business, so that's what our business does. And um, <clears throat> we've been open for about a year and a half. And before that, I had spent about eight and a half years working as a recruiter of actuaries. So that's kind of like with my old business. So that was closed down in March 2017, and then in April 2017, I opened, I formed the new business, the ideas, the concepts, and so on. And then by October of 2017, we took the new business to market, and we had already closed down the old business. So, so marketing October, November, December. By January 2018, we started picking up our first clients. <clears throat> so now we're about a year and a half down the line. So, so my background is, um, I, so I grew up in Johannesburg. <laughs> And um, so I went to King David, and then over the years, uh, I, I also went to Cape Town for two years after school, and uh, I attempted uh, UCT. So unfortunately, not that it's glamorous, <clears throat> I didn't complete UCT, and uh, and and then I, I went into then I went to London for two years, which also like very very useful as far as just getting experience in in you know standing on two feet. <clears throat> then after that two year stint doing various roles and we'll go into that as well uh, I did a lot of different jobs you know a lot of it was in sales marketing a little bit of sort of like um, <clears throat> uh, operational admin type stuff and then in 2008 uh, 2007 I got a, a job in recruitment with actuaries I worked there for one year and then a year and a half later I opened my own actuarial recruitment business I think I may have not said recruitment before but actual recruitment business which I ran for eight and a half years and that brought us to up till now. So that's my background. I'm a, I'm a Joburg boy <clears throat> and uh, I spent some time after high school in Cape Town in London and, and that's brought us to here. So uh, a little bit of a mixed bag, um, a lot of scars unfortunately, um, but now since 2010 I moved to, so after I opened the recruitment business for one year, I then moved to Cape Town and then for about seven and a half years I ran the recruitment business from Cape Town completely remotely as well. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so that's kind of the background. I, I now live in Cape Town and um, we just moved house. So I live a little bit closer to the beach. Something kind of a bit more. 
we can. <laughs> so, but why the virtual? Why a virtual <coughs> business? Why a remote business? Is it um, because now everything is going digital, or what, what, why did you get into a business that doesn't allow you to be, um, you know, hands on? <coughs> so what happened was, <coughs> firstly, that's the way the world is going. And if you don't get that, and you're holding on to uh, you know the ball and chains, you're wrong. Okay. Um, but in 2009, when I opened the recruitment business, I didn't have money for rent. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, for yes. rent for the business. Yes, yes, yes. So I had no choice but to work virtually and yes. digitally. Yes. So it was a necessity thing. Okay. And uh, and uh, and after about a year of working virtually and digitally and not meeting anybody, uh, it, it was working. Mm -hmm. It was actually working. The clients were liking the people I was bringing them, and um, and so I just got used to working digitally and virtually. What's nice now with social media and Facebook and LinkedIn and all that stuff and WhatsApp, uh, the loneliness of working from home has completely disappeared. So anybody, oh, anybody that says oh, I don't like to work from home, I'm so lonely. Well, what's the problem? But then the the, the discipline that comes with it, and also I've heard. I mean, I do also um, in my business. Most of the times that I have, I'm not in your work. And sometimes we struggle with people not trusting that you're doing what they want to meet you face to face. How do you how do you um, set up your business in such a way that it's, it's, it's trustworthy enough for them to not even think that you know, you're going to disappear or you just, uh, you know, somebody else with a website and, you know, a digital presence, but then, you know, they've never met you. How are they going to pay you lots of money if they've actually never personally met you? <clears throat> so what happens is that, excuse me, as a business person who aspires to be successful, mm. if you are not disciplined enough to work from home, okay, and actually work instead of watching soap operas, <laughs> yeah. then, then we need to sit down and have a very serious talk about your future and what's going to happen because if, if you are not disciplined you're going to find yourself 45 50 years old with nothing and you have nobody to blame but yourself and you should blame yourself so if you're not going to be disciplined I mean you know you can take the horse to water but if the water if the horse is not going to drink we'll get another horse okay mm -hmm. so I'm disciplined mm -hmm. so so you know I'm not watching cricket and I'm working mm -hmm. that's the first thing yeah okay the second thing is the client <clears throat> The clients are going to pick up quite quickly if you're a professional. You know, I think in any business that you work in, you either have to have professionalism and class, or you don't. And if you don't have professionalism, class, um, you're, 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 you're um, meticulous with your time, you're, there's a word for that, you're punctual, they are going to pick that up. Oh, he's late to the meetings, always, she's always late to the meetings. They're not going to want to work with you. So if you're not going to be disciplined in your professionalism, you're not going to pick up clients. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was always about you know the, the contracts, the terms of business, the emails that I'm responding to. Everything has to be professional. So the structure of your business works the same way as somebody that works from uh, a physical um, from physical premises. Definitely. And if you have people that you're working with, if you pick up that they are stuffing around you're not going to want to work with them. So, you know, it's not fair to say, like, for me, I need to be a very quick judge of character mm -hmm. and of professionalism mm -hmm. with the clients that I'm interacting with because if the client is not professional, they're not going to pay on time. They're going to have uh, expectations that are way beyond what they can afford. Mm -hmm. So I need to judge the client or the future client as much as they're judging me. So if they're not going to be professional, I'm not going to want to do work with it. And I've done it before, a lot. Clients engage with me, you know, they send a very like flaky email that has um, <coughs> spelling mistakes. Oh, we need this work done, blah, 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 you know, quote us. <coughs> okay, no problem, let's talk about it, you know. And if I find that they're not engaging in a professional way, well then I'll, I'll ignore them. I don't want their business. Because their business is just going to lead me down a rabbit hole of, of, of disaster. <coughs> So there's professionalism on both sides. That, you know, <clears throat> as much as I'm judging them, they're judging me. So, so there's, that's how it works. So you have to be professional, you have to be punctual, whether you're working from home or in an office. The only difference is in an office, and that's actually the reason why it takes so long to hire people, actually. 
is because they're trying to work out once and for all if you're worth hiring. Yeah. Because if you're not, they've made a massive mistake. Mm -hmm. And they're stuck with you. Mm -hmm. So that's why it actually takes a lot to hire people. Mm -hmm. So that professionalism thing is very important. And yes. I also assume that your, your teams are also virtual as well, right? Your team is also virtual as well. Yeah. How do you both, they, both. They both virtual and okay. Now that <laughs> no, no, we don't have offices. You don't have offices at all. So what, what do you mean more? So, two things. Number one, most of the people that I work with, I've never met them. Okay. Most of the people that work in the business, the actuaries, I've never met them personally. Mm -hmm. But I've known them for 10 years. Okay. Nine, 80% of the work that we're doing, the actuaries are working inside the client's offices anyway. Uh, okay. So as much as we're a virtual business and we're going to what we call the virtual actuary, <clears throat> Um, uh, a lot of the work is being done in the client's office on locked down client's laptops. It's very yeah. much, you know, real. Yes. So how do you then, uh, how do you then monitor productivity? Because, and, and I think that, well, our generation, we're cool with it. We're, you can work from wherever, as long as I get the work done, it doesn't matter. But for the, for the older generation, it's almost difficult for them to, for us to convince them that work can be done, even if, the people are not here, even if you are not physically interacting with you or seeing them on a daily basis. So, are there any productivity tools that you are then using to monitor their productivity as well to make sure they deliver on time? You know, timelines are met, the deadlines are met, etc. So there's a lot going on there. So the first thing is, I have a 10-year history of interacting with most of the actuaries. So what that means is before I even bring you into the business or before I want to include you in the business, we have a 10-year history of your manner on the phone and my manner on the phone. And I always made a note, friendly, rude, etc, etc. So before I even bring somebody into our business, I already know if it's somebody I want to work with. That's a good starting point. Most companies don't have that. The second thing is we do have operational uh, delivery managers. Okay. that work in the projects. So our projects are very much team-based, okay. very structured, and very organized okay. with weekly and daily deliverable updates. So what that means is that if anybody is not delivering or anybody is not performing, we'll pick it up quite quickly. Mm. So, we, you know, the same as one of the big consultancies. You know, so what we're not is an unprofessional group of actuaries that are working together, and it's like, how the hell do you monitor that? So that's not at all what we are. Okay. We're a very structured business that has different departments, different department leads, different senioritys of actuaries in those departments, and, and the clients are taking us on as a team, sometimes two or three, sometimes six, sometimes one, and the whole way along the line, <clears throat> we know, uh, you know there's updates, we, we work in Slack, what, you know, what are you currently doing? There's the delivery managers. So the truth is, is that's actually how the delivery happens at all the other big consultancies. Right, yeah, yeah. So we're an organized collaborative. So we'll go into our business model and then how it all works, but there's a lot of um, a quality. You see, quality is the key here. Because okay. the only reason we get, the only way we're gonna get to the size of the other consultancies is if we, from a risk perspective, we, we, we have the quality control that they have and the governance. Otherwise, we're just uh, unprofessional. So, so we're quite focused on, on emulating the delivery quality of all the other consultancies. So there's a lot of mechanisms yeah. in place. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. So before I, wanna, before I get into the subject of today from idea to pay customers, I just want to know if you guys have any questions around virtual actuary or around setting up virtual teams or anything that we've spoken about previously just now. The lady at the back. The one that just walked in, right? <laughs> Do we have any questions though around our virtual actuary? Okay. All right. Actually, yeah. Um, if if you do pick up that, that one of your team members maybe is, is a guy that, that works as just him at, at the place, and you pick up that there is some productivity issues with with the guy, um, how do you approach that? How do you get him to then pick up the slack? Or if he doesn't, how do you then you know complete? You know, I don't know if you get rid of him. Do you replace him? What is your sort of your process? <coughs> <clears throat> okay, so the question was asked is, how, you know, if, if we pick up a, a, a slight hiccup, how do we deal with it? So the first thing is, we don't get rid of people because 
because those involved with our business, the way that we've structured our business is they're not, it's not an employer-employee relationship. Okay, they are independent contractors that are part of what is known as an organized collaborative. That's the first thing, we'll, we'll go into that. So <clears throat> our business also works in what is known as a nurturing system. It works on a peer review nurturing system, and I'll go into why that's useful in an independent consulting scenario. It's quite complicated, but once I'll explain it, it'll make a lot of sense. <clears throat> it is very much worth our while to make sure that those that work in the business are successful. Because then as a, as a team, we will be more successful. So <clears throat> somewhere along the line, that person is either being nurtured by somebody, or they are the one that's senior and is nurturing others. And that's a little bit more complicated because they're obviously more senior. <clears throat> but generally, if somebody's not being productive, there's somebody that's overseeing that person because of the way that the business works, the way that the model works. <clears throat> and it's there, worth their while to make sure that that person is upskilled and is more professional and, 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 and does their job. If, <clears throat> on the other hand, the person is completely tricky to work with, by default, the way that we've set up the business as independent consultants that all work together in an organized collaborative, it's a self-governing system. You get invited into projects. You're not owned. It's a group of professionals that work together that are invited into projects under the virtual actuary banner. So if you're not performing, nobody will want to work with you on future projects. You're not going to be invited into future projects. It works the same way from the manager down to those that work underneath them. <clears throat> if the manager is nasty, that person will not want to work with that manager again. So when they're invited into the next project, do you want to work with Tina? Do you want to work with Jacques? Do you want to work with them? No, they were nasty. I didn't enjoy working with them. Okay, so then now Tina and Jacques have lost somebody that's working underneath them. So how can Jacques and Tina scale themselves up because nobody wants to work with them? So they're shooting themselves in the foot. So being a self-governing system where you're not an employee, you're not owned, you're not on a salary, you can't just go off and be lazy, mm. no one's going to want you. People aren't forced to work with you. Sure. They want to work with you. So, so we'll, we'll go into the actual model and how the whole thing works. But ultimately, it's a self-governing system. And, uh, and if you, you do it correctly, then um, people will want to work with you and it will scale. So we can go into that you know, as far as like how the actual model works. and We'll build up to that. Yeah. Do we have another question? So maybe I can just say a little bit about a little bit about what has brought me to this point, and I think it will be useful. <clears throat> so unfortunately, because I didn't finish university, unfortunately I went into sales. And that's what being an entrepreneur is all about. And it's not nice. Terrible. Terrible trying to find a product you can be proud of. A product that you can go and sell. Clients that you like working with. I've worked with different types of clients. Some are, are, are working in the in industries that are not corporate and prim and proper. And some are prim and proper. You know, you, you, you hope to work with nice people. So I've worked in a lot of different environments. And so as the years progressed, I worked in different sales environments, different products. Pro products and progress to working with actuaries. Mm. So now down the line, even when working in the recruitment business, you know, it, um, it's not glamorous being an entrepreneur. It's not fun and it's actually not nice. Unfortunately, it's tough. You know, like I was, I was like speaking to the Uber driver, she was like, hey, it's so nice to be an entrepreneur. Like, oh, it must be so nice to work for yourself. And so I said, well, the reality is, is that you got your own time. Well, the, the reality is, is that if you're working for somebody else, and come five o'clock in the evening, you're like, oh, oh, brilliant. You see the socks? Are these socks? Eh? <laughs> no, we, we work with that. No, we work with AWS. Yeah, we work with AWS. <laughs> and they, you know, they, they, they empowered us as a business to have a, a, a proper, robust cloud yeah. that allows us to compete with the big consultancies. Yeah. Because yeah. we have a big brother in our corner. You know, we don't have a five million rand server downstairs. We have yeah. AWS, yes. Yes. and so you know, the, the, you know, I, I work with their startup team, and, and they've helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. And as a startup, they also give you socks. Okay. <laughs> so don't worry about opening the business; just go for the socks. <laughs> so, 
So my point is, unfortunately, as an entrepreneur, it's myth. And as I was saying to the Uber driver, come 5 o'clock in the evening, if you want to be a business owner, independent, okay, no problem. Well, then go work from, 10 till, from 5 till 10 in the evening. Go work from 5 till 10. <clears throat> Why? Because that's what an entrepreneur is doing anyway. Oh, no, well, you know, I'm very tired. You know, I just want to put my feet up. I've had a rough day. Like, my boss is hectic. Well, if you are your own boss, you've had a rough day as well anyway. You're still working till. 10 o'clock, 11, 12 o'clock at night anyway. Mm -hmm. So the excuse that, it, that the effort is going to be easier when you're an entrepreneur and working for yourself is nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because the reality is if you're working for somebody else, come 5, 6 o'clock in the evening if you want to run your own business, you're going to have to put that same effort in anyway. Yes. So my point is being a business owner is tricky and it's tough and it's yeah. hectic. Yeah. So once you've had a little bit of success like we've had, I mean we picked up about 40 clients, it's actually more in our first year. We built about, you know, about 13 and a half million rand in our first year and in our second year, which is what we're in now, we'll probably double or even triple that, which is quite amazing, you know. And how did you do that in your first year? Because ah, a lot of this is where we're at. This is where we're at. I mean, we've read about it a lot of, a lot of times in magazines. Businesses don't make money in their first three years. Maybe in five years of operation. How did you then secure your first year of business then? Okay. So let's get on to the topic itself of from idea to paying clients. And, and hopefully we can be an interaction as well. You know, as yeah. I say, hopefully by the end yeah. of this, you know, I'm, I'm building up to being one of those amazing speakers. So we'll see what actually happens. You know. So far I'm on the AM, you know. So, uh, so we'll see how we go, in my opinion, of course. Yeah. So what happens is that... Whether you're working in the corporate world or, 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 or you're just a young entrepreneur that has an idea. So the first starting point in my opinion is you're a young entrepreneur, you have an idea. Okay, cool. So why do you think that you're going to be a successful business person? Oh, it's very glamorous to be an entrepreneur. Okay, cool. Well, what experience do you have? So, you know, the starting point that I say to entrepreneurs is if you have an idea, Experience have you got any actual corporate experience? Have you actually worked for other people? Like, why does that idea have to be done today? Well, passion. Passion is <laughs> awesome. Can't you go get some experience first? So, so my ideas started after 12 years of working for other people from the age of 18. So why would you then say are the most basic, you know, basic experience that one can equip themselves with before they start. Passion aside, um, cool idea aside, I know it's going to work aside, I believe in myself, all of those things aside, but what are some of the most basic um, capabilities one must have before they take their leap and say, okay, now I'm ready? Okay, so I'll give you a quick example. So let's say you now have an idea and now your goal is to invoice a client and get paid. Isn't that like the goal? Okay. Yeah. So that's the goal. You know, you have an idea, okay? Pay me. Okay. I, I want to see the money coming in. Like, a ching, 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 you know, somewhere along the line, you have to have a good administration system that the contract has gone out, has the client signed the contract. You now have people doing the work, are your emails working nicely? You have to have a good admin system so that somewhere along the line, the client has bought your product, you've had to pay somebody for that product, whether it's at a real product or a service, where is that product being stored? So somewhere along the line, the people that you're storing the product uh, in their warehouse, or the people that are delivering the product, you've got contracts with them. So what is your filing system like? Have you got folders that say suppliers, delivery, clients? What is your filing system like on your computer? Is it organized? You have to have contracts with all of them. You have to co have contracts with the delivery people. You have to have a bank account. You have to have... Um, all the different phase and FICA stuff organized and you know if a client phones you out of the blue, oh, can you send us your BE certificate? 
do you have it on file that you can quickly send it to them and move on? If you don't have a good filing system, you're never going to get to a point where a client's going to want to engage with you. So let's say you've got a good filing system. So what will eventually happen is you'll do the work or the client will buy the product. You have to invoice them. So what invoicing system are you using? What are, who is your accountant? Is the invoicing correct? Are you VAD registered? Aren't you VAD registered? Do you have to be registered for PAYE? Don't you? Everything has to be on the invoice. So then you have to now send the invoice. Then the client has to pay. The client has to have the bank account. Okay? And eventually you'll get paid. So if you don't have a good admin system, no, nope, the clients are going to sniff it out in a split second. Oh, this person's very unprofessional. You know? So if that admin system isn't organized, you're never going to get paid. So you have to be, you know, so, so that's a nice example. Where the only way to work, oh, how does that work? Is to have spent two years working in the payments department at some building construction business. You're the one chasing for, you think once you send out the invoice, they're going to pay immediately. You got a phone, oh, can you send us a receipt? And oh, you didn't put our registration number, you didn't, didn't I need it to put it in there? Well, it's now a month down the line and they haven't paid because you didn't have the registration number on your invoice. Well, you need to know that there should be a registration number on the invoice. Their registration number, company registration. So my point is the only way to know that stuff as an entrepreneur without wasting your time and being like, Flake, I have this idea, I can't get paying customers. Well, obviously, because no one wants to pay you because you don't have the right information on the invoice. So all that stuff you can learn having worked for a year or two in the operational side of, a, of an advertising company. That's just, that's just operational invoicing. They've got marketing. Okay? What do I know about marketing? She's like, how do I tell? I want radio ads. I'm like, okay, how does it work? You know? So each way along the line, whether you're hiring people and you're doing the contracts or, or whatever you're doing, it, you have to have experience to have the whole turnkey solution so that you can get paid in the end. So that's kind of a little example mm. of, of why a youngster you're looking to do something doesn't have normal working experience. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow. Do we have any questions, guys? Is that useful? Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so now, okay. Yeah. Alright. Sorry. I'm no worries. In terms of getting your cards, was it mostly word of mouth? Okay. Okay, cool. So from idea to paying clients. That's why we're here. So what happened was, when I decided to pivot the business, scary. You know, we had a recruitment business that had actuaries, and, you know, pretty much LinkedIn, you know, makes it like, why do you need to use me as a recruiter? LinkedIn, like, go to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I needed to pivot the fact that I had the network of actuaries. Okay. So now, it took two years and actually I want to say something first before I forget okay so the only reason that I'm sitting here the only reason it's not because I'm so amazing although I am on M A M Z now I think I'm on live Z now the only reason I'm here is because we have amazing actuaries that work in our business and when you see me sitting here like this, this is not my tie, it's one of the actuary's ties. It's not my jacket, it's one of the actuary's jacket. This pair of pants is for the daughter and the son of one of the other actuaries. This shoe, the shoes, they shine. You know why they're shining? Because I'm thinking about the families of the actuaries that work in our business. And their hopes and dreams. And that's why I look like I look. Because I'm not representing myself. I'm representing a whole group of people that want to be successful in their lives. That have left the corporate world to join what we call our organized collaborative of actuaries. And I definitely want to touch on that. So as you see me sitting here, the only reason why I'm sitting here is because I'm like the mouthpiece of all the actuaries that work in our business. So I hope that I'm doing them justice for their hopes and dreams and what they want to accomplish. That's the first thing I want to say. Okay? The, <laughs> okay. the second thing is, when I needed to pivot the idea of the recruitment, two years of trying to work out what do you do with the network of actuaries? What do you do with the network of accountants? What do you do with the network of engineers? It's a very difficult question to answer. How do you pivot your business? So I went through four different ideas. Business ideas. I was going to do a credit card for actuaries. I was going to do monthly gift packs. Whole thing. Two years of dissecting those ideas. And eventually, 
after two years of dissecting those ideas, and God bless my wife, you know, and, and you know, my wife runs the business with me. <clears throat> um, and she heard all the ideas. We came up with virtual actuary, and I was like, okay, we'll run it as, as, as consulting actuaries. So how business works is that we're the same as the big consultancies. The main difference, actuaries working in the client's office is identical to the other consultancies, are absolutely identical. The main difference is we don't have office space. It's one of the reasons we're virtual. We don't have the office space. We don't need it. What, what do we need the expense? And it's just an additional cost anyway. Additional cost. Yeah. The actuaries are working inside the client's office, so we can charge less than half for the same actuary doing the, that same piece of work. So when they will work in the other consultancies, they're doing the same work with us inside that same client. The big, the big clients, and most of our clients are really, really big. The second thing is when the client pays, at the end of the month, and our contracts are one year, two year, they're ongoing, six months, completely ongoing, we're not doing small stint work. When the client pays, we just hold back a very small percentage, very small, 10 to 18 percent, sometimes even less, and the actuaries get most of the money. So what we've done is we've turned the earnings table upside down. The company takes a little bit, and the actuaries get most of the money. And that's what, okay, so we're an organized collaborative, and I'll, I definitely want to talk about that. So what happened was, when I realized that we could form a business of an organized collaborative of actuaries, and then I, I, like I closed down the recruiting business, so from April, April, May, June, July, August, September, I thought if I can gather together 20 actuaries that are independent, they don't work at another company, and they're all full time. They're independent actuaries. If we can all go forward as a team under the virtual actuary banner, we have a business. You could do the same in the publishing world. You could do the same for accountants and engineers. You're an organized collaborative of business professionals that takes on work at the clients. So when I had 20, we were ready. We then went to WordPress, and there's other websites, uh, 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 templates. We bought the, the template, and I then put all the content on the website. We had a website. We then had um, a design person do a kick-ass logo. In my opinion, it's a kick-ass logo. Have you seen our logo? It is, is it kick-ass? It is kick-ass. <laughs> okay. She's a real pro. You know, we were going for that like sort of like um, Wall Street banking look, you know, but like young Wall Street banker. Uh, that's what I think mean. we, we, we hit the nail on the head. Yeah. So once we had the logo, once we had the website up and we had the email address, you know, we needed to register the business. So, so the truth is no one's going to give you work unless you have your .com. We got the .com. Unless the company is registered with a registration name. Unless you have the emails, ID, advert, you know, whatever the email address is, you know. Then you need the, the website up and running, you know, ready to go. So that if, you, and then the website content will actually create the company profile. That's how it works. Then ready to go to market so the go-to-market strategy was me personally phoning about 388 senior director actuaries across South Africa who I've known for 10 years October uh, October November December now I want to do a little quick exercise in your head I want you to count up to 388 try it now let's go just count up to 388 and I can tell you what's going to happen when you get to 30 you'll be like Jesus that's a lot like 30, like yeah. Think of how long it takes you just to count to 30. Yeah. Imagine finding 388 people in three months. So the go-to-market strategy is stop being lazy and pick up the phone. So after 388 people wow. were phoned and senior director actuaries, by January 2018, they started phoning us. It was a quick four-minute phone call. You know, we, we, we now have a consultancy. We charge a lot less. Our actuaries get most of the money. We're an organized collaborative. You know, we're a proper business. Our actuaries have run as partners and senior directors the other consultancies, they're now with us, bring us business, we'll charge you less, we'll do the same work. Uh, Jay, here's a company profile. Mm. Oh, okay, very nice. Well, they start CCing everybody in and have you guys see this new business on the market. Well, they go to the website, well, he's got a LinkedIn profile. They look legit. Mm. By January, they started phoning us back. Mm. And it's, the, it's also, like, I love that you said, get on. Get, get, get on the phone and keep calling people. Because it also, a lot of people think they've got a brilliant idea and they don't do anything about it. So as your effort into making that idea actually alive also you know, matters more than, more than the idea itself. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. <clears throat> See, so, so what happened was in, in February 2018, we started picking up our first client. 
But, but before that, before we could start phoning clients, we had to have our terms of business in place. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. I'm the consultancy, same as the yes. big four or the big five, yes. whatever it is, and I want to engage with all the biggest insurers in South Africa, the biggest banks, and okay, what are your terms of business? Yes. What's a 20-page document? So I've got a template. And I reworded every third word. That's flipping, it takes long. I but, think it's amazing. I'm sorry to, to, to touch it. I think it's amazing because then it also minimizes the back and forth. Hi, I want to ask about this. You know, okay, did you read the terms of service? Did you read the did you read the documents so that you can get all the answers there? Because also the other thing that we also don't think about a lot is sometimes there's this long, you know, this prolonged conversation between people which is unnecessary and can be eliminated. Unprofessional. You know? So wow, that's amazing. So they're dealing with the other consultancies, they will have terms of business. Yeah. Like, okay, that looks legit. Nice. Okay. So then I'm part of the organized collaborative as well. Excuse me, I have to earn my keep. Okay. So now the client, so that's I do the business development, the admin, the operational. My wife helps as well. She's on maternity leave now, um, but very involved. So now the clients start phoning you back. Okay, Adi, you know we want our end of year evaluation done for our reinsurance business. Mm -hmm. That's pretty hectic. Like they're calling my bluff. Okay, you said you got actuaries. You said you got consultants. You're an organised collaborator. Okay, well let's let's have a conversation. Mr. Big Shot, let's say, okay. <laughs> so now you've got to bring some decent people to the table. Exactly. Let's yeah. talk. So now we come, we rock up at the table, and I've got two ex senior managers sitting with the client. The client's like, jeez, you know, like you're more senior than me. Mm. Okay, you guys can handle this with your eyes closed. Okay, what are you going to charge us now, sir? Now that's a tricky conversation to have. Mm. You know, how much would you pay the big four? Okay, we'll charge you like less than half. <clears throat> that's nice. Okay, what's your budget? Okay, cool, we'll do it. We put together an engagement letter. We have to have the engagement letter templates. The actuaries put that together, we send it to the client. The client sees they've got terms of business, a proper engagement letter. These, these guys are the real deal. This is exactly how the other consultancies do it. So if yeah. you are going to take your idea and you're going to try and get paying customers, the only way to do it is to have all your admin and your contract stuff in place. Now, the actuaries or the professionals, for them to interact with me in the business, they would never have done that. So, okay, well, let's see the contract. Mm. Okay, so you want to work with us? Let's see the contract. So, and then I will, I think, like now we can speak about the organized collaborative, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. But I then send a 20 page contract to the actuaries. So, if we're going to work together, it's a contract by contract contract. If I can bring you work and you can do the work, I'll just, the business will just take a small percentage, mm -hmm. you'll get most of the money. You know, SARS will term you a personal services provider, so therefore when the client pays us, we'll just hold back that very small percentage, we'll hold back the tax, and you get the rest. That's more than double what you would get at another consultancy. Are you happy with the contract? Love the contract, very professional, Adi. So then they sign it now, you've got the team. So now you're sitting with the client, the clients now, you've got proper actuaries involved, You've got terms of business, you've got an engagement letter, the client's looking at us, they're sitting with the actuaries. Well, there's no difference than dealing with another consultancy, then they sign. Mm -hmm. And the work begins. Okay? And then the actuaries do the work, sometimes six months, a year. At the end of each month, I then do the invoice. We've got our invoicing system up and running. We're on board, so, so then there's also the onboarding process. Being part of the preferred suppliers is hectic. Like you think being an entrepreneur is fun, Talk, try and get onto preferred suppliers list of the biggest banks in South Africa. Oh, yeah, mm. yeah. Very hectic. Mm. So my point is you have to have all that stuff in place. But if you do, then the clients, when you invoice them, will pay. And as soon as they pay, we then pay the actuaries and everybody's happy. But uh, we're think, literally at the bottom of the run. I think Neil had a question. Um, yeah, no, it's been answered. It was answered. Okay. Do you have follow-up questions? <coughs> So, you undercut the big four, when do you think you're going to get undercut? So I'm under no illusions that there's a young hotshot around the corner. Under no illusions. So therefore our business and our service cannot be stagnant and flat. We have to completely make sure that we're disrupting ourselves yes, yes. in our service. Yes in the industry. So that's about vision, that's about 
you know, you're coming across as a consultancy, okay, but we call the business Virtual Actuary because our goal is actuaries consulting from home in virtual and augmented reality. So we call the business Virtual Actuary. So, you know, the, the reason why we, we consult virtually, yes, we're inside the client's office, but Amazon Web Services has pretty much allowed us to have that cloud server that we don't have to pay for. They even, they're so secure, they even take their own hardware and put it inside the client's offices, the biggest banks, the biggest insurers. The hardware's on their property. It allows, so, so, so the, the IP, the, the, the intellectual property doesn't leave their property. But, but Amazon allows us to have virtual private networks that allow us to log in and work and, and all the stuff on the client's office. So we couldn't do that before, um, but, but, we, but we can now because we're empowered and it, it took us a while to get to that and point. And there's this high-tech security around it as well. Hectic, and then yeah. there's, there's Poppy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, the highest tech you can get. There's like two main, three main companies in the world that like, can compete with the AWS. And we did a quite a stringent um, due diligence and, and, and a, you know, choosing process and we went with that. Yeah. So, so let's just very briefly talk about, so, so in order to get your product to market, this is really the, the key, is you have to be able to have a product that you believe in, or a service that you believe in, and you need to be able to talk to your pain, to your clients about buying that service. Okay? And it's not going to build itself. It's not going to sell yes. itself. Yes. Like for an entrepreneur to say, yes. oh, you know, I'm not really into sales, you know, I'm an introvert. We hear that a lot, especially like tech entrepreneurs that pop up in the scene as well. I'm, I'm, I'm a developer. I'm a salesperson, you know. So you need to get out there and sell Okay. That's right. And you need to be able to spoon feed the clients that dealing with you is seamless. I love that. I love that. Because if, if you can't paint the picture for them of the different steps that they are going to take mm. by engaging with you, they're not going to see the full picture and it's always going to be, okay, well let's talk more about it. And, I mean, it's, it's very simple. Mm. We're going to organize a meeting now. We're going to have our professional sit with you at the table. Mm. We want to understand what the scope of the work is, yes. what the deliverable yes. is, who's going to be involved in our team, how much your budget is, what you want to do, yes. how serious are you about starting immediately. Once we know that, we'll then drop an engagement letter. Our engagement letter will have all that stuff. And if you're happy with it, I'll send it to you. And if you're happy to go ahead, sign here and we can start the work. Yes. If you cannot say that to a client like that, you know, you're, you have an app, you want to get users. Okay? So how do you get those users to buy your product? Well, you have to understand where are your users hanging around? Mm -hmm. Well, go there. Mm -hmm. Whether it's digitally, wherever it is, you have to understand somewhere along the line, you have a product, you sell wall paint that um, goes luminous and in fact it is uh, it, it, like, like you can switch the lights off and the paint itself, the lights will stay on. That's quite a good product. But you need to sell it. So yeah. who are you going to sell it to? Well, you're not really going to sell it to a place like this. You can go to the paint stores. You say, well, you know, this is our paint. It's amazing. But here's, here's, we'll give you a poster. We'll give you all the stuff. So that anybody that comes into your shop that looks at it will know, well, this is something new. This is how it works. Okay, we'll order it from you. What's your return policy like? Here's the documentation. This is our return policy. We'll even deliver it for free. Because you don't know want the client to say, well, how are you going to deliver it? I really thought about that. So you have to understand the whole way along the line that when dealing with the customer, if they're going to buy your product, don't let them ask the question. Just say, well, if you're thinking about this particular issue, this is how we've dealt with it, and this is, you know, so you, oh, that's very useful. Okay, well, when we're ready to order, we'll let you know. Great! Not expecting you to buy it today. Mm. If you want to buy it today, we can sign right now. So, so that's kind of a little bit about taking your product to market is that you have to be able to sell it yourself. Mm. You know, and like, you know, sometimes I sit in the meetings with the actuaries and it's like a really hectic conversation. Like, it's really, really, you know, very meticulous. I'm not an actuary. <coughs> very technical, very hectic. You know, I sit in those meetings. The actuaries deal with it. But at the end of the conversation, the client will always say, okay, Aggie, you know, where to from here? Mm -hmm. I can't say, oh, 
I, I don't get involved in those technical things. But, but that's not my department. <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you mean it's not your department? The client wants to buy from you. They're asking you where to from here. So it's concentrate. Sit in the meeting, understand what they're talking about. Because I have to summarize those meetings at the end of the meeting. And then you know, and then the client then the actors will drop the engagement letter and I'll send it to the client. Yeah. And and, and I need to now talk about the price of the client. So they want me to be a subject matter expert, even though I'm not an actuary. I have to force myself. Yeah. Very, very difficult. But we got it right. Yeah. To build 30 million rand in our second year is not bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well done. Well done. I want to talk about um, invoices that you're going um, What structures can small business owners put in place to make sure that, especially when you're dealing with cost and all oh, our payment policy is between 30 and 60 days or whatever, 100 days, and sometimes two years worth. What structures can we put in place that protect SMEs um, in order for the invoices to be paid on time? Especially, and I'll just give you this and I'll just give you this the SME probably can't afford a buyer, can't afford a legal team or whatsoever. And we do know very well that SMEs rely on you know, invoices being paid on time. So what do we do then? Which is very important. Very important. So how it works with us is that most of our clients are very big. Mm -hmm. So we know we're going to get paid. Once, if, if the, if, Even if it's up to 100 points. <laughs> you know, and also, uh, we also insist on, on, on seven days uh, of the invoice, on invoice, even okay. if their policy is 30. Like I will rather say, you know, I will rather say to the big client, okay. you know, our actuaries only get paid when we get paid. Okay. <coughs> so therefore, it has to be seven days on invoice. Okay. And if it's not going to be seven days on invoice, then we can't do work with you. So it means that your product is so good that they must feel the need to even restructure their policy to suit you because they need you guys to work on that on Yes, yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll reword what you said by saying that as an entrepreneur, as a business person, mm -hmm. you have to be willing to walk away. Shut. Or, wow, guys. <laughs> okay. Or be, Shut. Take, or be taken advantage of. Okay. Shut. So if you're not willing to walk away, you're going to get taken advantage of. So what happens is, in the big clients, we know we're going to get paid. In the smaller clients, which do come to us, it's not really who we chase, but they do come to us. Smaller companies, I don't know them. Multi-million rand companies, but they're not billion dollar rand companies. And we just launched in the US, so that's going to be, um, that's going to be hectic. Okay? Yeah, we opened a business in the US in January. Mm. It's our big push now. Mm. Very, very big push. Mm. Got teams that are forming there and in Hong Kong and in Australia, there's a lot to talk about. Great. So when it comes to invoicing, the smaller clients are asked for a deposit. There's my contract. Mm -hmm. Being an entrepreneur means having tough conversations. Yes. And knowing how to 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 have those tough conversations, how to articulate those tough conversations <laughs> this one. Yeah. You know, you can't hide under the pillow. You need to step up to the plate and have those conversations. So when I speak to the CEOs of the smaller companies, I can just explain in a very nice way. You know, the reality is, is he has the engagement letter, but I need a 20,000 rand deposit for, for, for 15 hours of work. Because I cannot risk that actually doing 15 hours of work and me invoicing you, and you're like, mm, you know what, I will get up to it. Because it work that way. Like, you got to pass the deposit, we'll do the work. Once you pay me the deposit, if that work carries on, we have a bit of trust now. So I'll invoice you every second week. Mm. So that I'm, because when we don't get paid, that actually is not going to like me anymore. Addy, why weren't you sorted? I don't care that they're not paying us. So then, you know what the reality is? I will have to pay them out of my pocket. Mm. Because you also don't want to mess up your relationship. With Hundred percent. Yeah. So, so invoicing is very, very important. Yeah. And and you have to be willing to take a deposit. So I'll, let me, because we don't have that long, but I definitely want to tap, you know, tap on this particular issue. And, and I'll say this to entrepreneurs. And as I said, I, I said right at the beginning, I hate being an entrepreneur. Like my dream was always to like work at Deutsche Bank or R and B and I can invest there. Woo! Look at my Jimmy Choose, even though I'm not a girl, you know. <laughs> So, um, so 
since I am an entrepreneur, so you know, unfortunately, I've had to to work in in the real world where we, we try and succeed. So our business model is known as an organized collaborative. Have you ever heard that term? So I thought it a bit earlier. An organized collaborative is as follows. In the corporate world right now, there are different departments. Those departments have a job. Okay, let's say you're in the publishing world. It's an easy example. Okay? You have two journalists. You have a, one doubles as an, as an editor. You have uh, two salespeople, you have a design person, and you have somebody that knows social media and marketing. Or if you're in print, somebody that's printing to make the, you know, doing the printing and in interacting with the printers. They are running those big organizations, the big publishing firms. But what happens in the corporate world is that you'll do your job, you'll get your salary. But somewhere along the line, the company's making money, the sales team is making money. When that money comes into the bank account for the business, where does that money go? It goes on salaries, it goes on rent, and it goes on profit. Who's winning? The corporate. That's why they're doing so well. That's why they've got such big offices. Now let's say those people that were running those departments, the two journalists and the two salespeople and the design person and um, and the person that, are, that knows printing or social media. Let's say they broke away. There's three scenarios that can play themselves out. Either you're an independent gig economy type person and you're subcontracting yourself back into the corporates. Okay, you're not going to make that much because they'll probably pay you salary levels. Or you can form a boutique corporate business with your partners. The same as the big corporate, you're a publishing firm. You split the profits but you also split the expense. You've got big office space. And, and, but you split the, the profits. You're a small boutique business. But if one of the partners isn't performing, you're stuck with it because now you've agreed, you're splitting it five ways. That's what often happens. Or you're an independent. Our business model is the fourth one, completely different. This is how it works. You have the independent professionals in the publishing world all working together. Okay? Under the banner, the virtual entry banner, whatever the banner is. Uh, ABC Publishing. You, you're releasing two magazines, a women's magazine and a men's magazine. Somewhere along the line, someone's writing those articles. So the arrangement is as follows. Hey guys, we don't pay salaries. But when we get money in, which will happen, because at the big publishing companies, if you're not making money, they're going to die as well. Somewhere along the line, money's coming in. So when that money comes in, the business will just take a small percentage. The collaborative will split the rest according to who did what. So the, the journalist will get, if one journalist worked on one thing, they'll get it, the design person and the sales person, that's it. Then you have an operational admin person doing the invoicing and all that stuff. Eventually the business will be releasing magazines, okay, and money will be coming in. But the main difference in an organized collaborative is that those that work in the collaborative get most of the money. It's organized. No one gets salaries, you all split the money that comes in, but not equally because that's not fair. So our business is an organized collaborative of actuaries. You can do the same with engineers, accountants, um, possibly lawyers, and in the publishing world. The key is to have an overall shell that you work as a business, and when the client pays, the main difference is that the majority of the profit goes to those that work in the business, not to the corporates. So our yardstick is, in five years' time, when we look at how have we performed, how have we performed, well, how many of our actuaries built three-story houses? Not did we build a massive building in sand. That's our yardstick. That's a new way of working. It's the gig economy, it's the virtual business. It's an organized collaborative. I really do, because you find a lot of successful businesses, but then when you're looking at the people that are making the business successful, are nowhere close to that. And that is just unfair. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, the curtain has been moved. You know, the corporates are taking most of the money. But the truth is, is that the, cons you know, the consultants, the people working in the business are doing most of the work anyway. Mm. That's not fair. Mm. So if you just organize, you just collaborate together, but it has to be organized. You have to have your, your, your terms of business and your contracts and your invoicing, everything in place. Eventually the client will pay, then you split the money. But you pre-arrange. When that publisher, publication comes out and we sell 20,000 copies or we have people doing advertising on the internet, when that money comes in, you will get 
40%, you will get 20%, you'll get 10%, the company will take five. So everyone knows that when the money comes in, this is what I'll get. Eventually it will start rolling over. You're kind of like a mini corporate, but the main difference is you get most of the money. So that's how, this is what is known as an organized collaborative. And in my opinion, you know, with the gig economy, you see, back in the day, you couldn't compete with the big corporates. You call it the gig economy. Well, the gig economy is professionals all working together. Okay. Sorry, the gig economy is, I have a gig. I'm a designer, I'm an accountant, I'm an, an actor, an engineer, and I'm doing gigs, so I'm, I'm doing uh, contracting work. That's how many of the terms. So what happens is, is that um, back in the past, you couldn't take on the big consultancies, the, the, the big uh, firms, because how are you going to collaborate? How are you all going to work together? Yeah. We need office space. We use Slack. Mm. Like you should see my Slack on my phone. Like, yeah. like different rooms, different actuaries, software, ideas, projects, all working in there, like talking, collaborating, like proper hardcore meetings. And we use Zoom. We use Zoom to have group chats together. Proper hardcore working. And you have to be professional for self-governing system. You know, back in the day, we, Conferencing facilities. The only companies that could have publishing conferencing facilities is those that had a room publishing, you know, sorry, conferencing. You'd have to get the client to go into their office and our office and then you'd have like a, a VC, a video chat. Now you can do it on your phone. So the barrier to entry now for a young person in the digital world to be able to compete with the big companies has completely dissipated. <coughs> you just have to use the tools to to, to <coughs> together. And then when it comes to well, what server are you using, we don't have a 5 million RAM server, we need a special room to cool it, we don't need that anymore, we've got AWS. Yeah. You see that everything works together to move forward. Now it sounds simple, but obviously you, know, it, you, know, you really have to sit down and think about how it's going to work and structure. Yeah. Guys, do you have any questions? We're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, yeah. just, just a quick one on your payment uh, system. Do you only release funds when the project's over? So so no, at the end of each month. Okay. Every month. So you're holding those funds then all the no, time. No, 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 the, the clients pay monthly. We invoice monthly. You know, we, we already know how much we're going to invoice them every month based on the hours or based on, on, on a set monthly fee. When the client pays at the end of that month, we pay immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So then I think just very, very briefly, just to tap on my history because I don't want to push the business too much. Mm -hmm. I think as you see me sitting here, I'll, I just want you to know one thing. I wake up at six o'clock almost every single morning. Okay, sometimes five. Mm -hmm. By seven o'clock, I'm already like, you know, cranky. cranky. Mm -hmm. You know, coffee. By eight o'clock, I'm at the gym. Mm -hmm. Like every morning. Mm -hmm. It's after Saturday. Mm -hmm. Eight o'clock, I'm at the gym. Mm -hmm. By like nine o'clock, like I'm back home, and like I'm eating something. I'm like, like I've already had like a full day, and I'm ready to give it my all. You know. Come like I work the whole day. Come five, six o'clock in the evening. Unfortunately, and I, I hope that you will agree and resonate with what I'm just about to say. I don't spend my Saturdays and Sundays having brides at my friends. Unfortunately, you need to decide. You either want to be a successful business person and you give up your free time, your evenings, your weekends, your prize, and your social life. Or you want to be the person that rocks up at the bar and says, hey, woo, get me here, woo, yeah, get me, sure. It's awesome, and it's very attractive, but it's not for the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur needs to decide, do you want to be successful, do you want to have fun? Do you want to have, like I'm sorry to say, I'm flipping boring, like, like socially, like I don't have a social group. I don't rock up and uh, you know get together with a gang. I haven't had that for 15 years. Where I have my fun is sometimes I squeeze out. I live right by the beach and I go kind surfing. You know, my, my thrill factor is you're heading towards a wave, you know, the wind's like 35 knots, it's basically hurricane weather. You know, you're thinking to yourself, I'm gonna hit this jump. And there's people downwind from me. And I could die. I'm probably going to die. And you can feel like 20 horses pulling on that kite. You're riding towards that road. Thinking, oh, it's a big wave. And you hit it. And you throw the kite this way. And you can feel the tension. And you hit the top of the wave. Bam! You pop. Now you're like four or five stories up in there. And you're like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You know? And you're like, whoa, there's someone there. Whoa. And then there's a moment there where you think you're not going to make it. 
and then you land. One splash, and you ride away, and you're like, oh no. Do you see that? Do you see that? And you're like, oh my god, there's another way. Can't handle this. You're like, look, I'm going for it. You see your friend, hey, watch this. And you go, you hit that next wave. You're in the air, you're like, oh my god, I'm going to die. And then you land. And there's a moment there where you ride away. And you have to you actually calm down. You're like, just walk, stop, just you know, strive carefully. You're going to have a heart attack. And you do that. And at the end of the session, once you've survived, because it can get very, very, very dangerous and very scary and very hairy. You're on the beach, you've landed your kite, and now you're looking around, the sun setting, and you're thinking, so I woke up early, I put my effort in, I'm not at the bar drinking, I'm not doing things, I'm not doing adultery, I'm not thinking about negative, disgusting things. I'm an entrepreneur, I want to succeed, integrity, quality, and I can just say actuaries have got the most integrity you'll ever meet in your life. You know, the Actuarial Society of South Africa, the standards are like ridiculously high. Mm. You're on the beach, and you're just thinking, that was hectic. You get in your car and you're driving home, you arrive there, you have some dinner, and you're thinking, I guess I'm not that boring. You know? And you sit at your computer, and you start answering the emails that came in <laughs> while you were kite surfing. Yeah. So that's the, that's the entrepreneur life. And the theory is, I could be wrong, <laughs> the theory is if you do that right for 15 years, when you're 50, then you can have that social life that you want. Have the people around you, you want to get a white bike, you want to get a jet ski, whatever you want. You can have all that stuff. And you can enjoy your 50s till your 80s if you do it right. You know, but if you're going to be irresponsible, uh, I'm not lecturing you, you know, I'm just saying, unfortunately, I'm, just, I'm saying how uh, we, we, we're building our business, we're building a global business, you know, and we're competing with the biggest companies in the world, multi-billion dollar companies. But in my opinion, they don't stand a chance. Do you know why? They've got a massive office space. Their whole thinking is wrong. You think the people that work there want to work there as corporate, like, employees? No, they don't. So, you know, so once we start getting the momentum, which we are, you know, I mean, you know, 30 million rand in our second year. I can assure you now, as soon as the US business takes off at all, you know, but the mindset is we're a lean business, we don't spend money on, on unnecessary stuff, we outsource our stuff. And, uh, and, and so that's kind of like the story is, is just don't start, like, and when it comes to funding, like, I don't want to go too much, but when it comes to funding, what do you need the money for? Oh, we need office space, you know, we need oh, someone that's to pay my salary, and, you know, you have to have a runway. What are you talking about? Mm. Pick up your phone, go find some clients, bring some people together, get some paying clients. Go <laughs> get some money. Don't worry about investors. You'll spend all your time wooing investors. You're going to let you down anyway because they go, well, you're going to get to the end of the road. They're going to say, well, you don't have any clients. Well, obviously, I don't have clients. I've been talking to you for three months. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is just go get those clients anyway. Mm. Yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. Wow, Aji, that was amazing. Yeah. That was so good. <laughs> you still around, right? No, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. No, I'm flying out tonight as well. No, yeah. no but I'm, just, I'm saying like after this, I'm sure sure. there's some people who want to, some of our attendees would want to have a quick chat with you. Uh, I just want to say thank you for that. Like, that was probably one of the best interviews I've ever had. And I really appreciate you flying from Cape Town to come here in Dover to give us your wisdom around your business. If I could do it again, I could have you here again as a guest speaker, I would do it like twice. You are amazing and thank you. And I hope your business grows and becomes stronger. If there's anything that we can do as the South Bank community, just take it wonderful. Actually, how, how we met, we actually met on LinkedIn. We friends, are we, are we friends or con connections? <laughs> LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm your best friend. I've got socks for you. I'm going to get matching shoes. I'm going to get matching uh, socks as well from AWS. Yeah, we met on LinkedIn and he literally gave me a call and said, hey, um, I'd love to come to the front. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and that's just how easy it is. And literally, I also did, obviously did my due diligence or my research around your business and the moment I saw Bushel, I was like, oh, speaks my language. 
because I I think we now need to start equipping ourselves into moving into the digital space and you know, being online and, and adapting it and really making it our reality as well. So I couldn't have said no to that. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you actually did take that forward and told me and asked to be a startup client. I, I felt like this is what we need, not only for myself, but also for the audience members as well, for our attendees as well. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. When it comes to LinkedIn, do you realize what you have there? You have the ability to get hold of your clients and directors and managers yeah. and in their pocket. That you wouldn't meet them on a normal day. You need to get yeah. through the secretary, you need to set up a meeting, she's traveling, mm. she's a very important executive. Mm. Like literally, connect with them. Don't write long messages. <laughs> just quick and easy, hey, you know, just want to very quickly want to just chat with you. Take two seconds. Like, can I get yourself an I promise you it won't take long. Mm -hmm. And then they'll send you the number and phone them. Buzz is in their pocket. You know, you're doing something, you're having an event, or oh, just you know, wasn't sure if you saw this. Yeah. Just has the link to the YouTube. Nothing hectic. When in history have you ever had access to executives like that? Yeah. We're living in the first times ever. Like literally everything is just on our fingertips. And that's the beauty of it. Beauty. It makes things much, much, much easier. Yeah, so just don't be scared. Mm. It doesn't matter if you get rejected and people say, oh, you were very, very, you know, you, you were a bit pushy. It was a bit pushy. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, I'll be pushy with the next 10 people. Hopefully they'll give me some work. Like you obviously don't like this, you know. No. Ah, disconnect that person, you know. Yeah. Block them, you know. You know, before you know what's going on, you're like, ah, you know, social media, you know, hello pizza, you know, ah, disgusting, you know. You know That's how you deal with clients. You know. So my point is, is that to just push and um, go make some money. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Mm, thank and. You.